does he do? He might go all the way. He gives it a ride. It's a chance. It'll be a goal. This is the Swans Cast Extra, the number one Sydney Swans weekend preview podcast. In this week's episode, we preview the Swans round 21 match against Port Adelaide Power on Saturday afternoon at Adelaide Oval. We're leaning on ancient history here and we're praying to the rain gods for this one. We've got the team changes, the latest stats, we preview the match ahead and give you our matchups, key points, predictions and the weekend forecast. Skipper Justin, that is me, is back on deck and he's joined by footy nerd Stephen Park. Stephen, it's great to have you back on again and it's great to be back. Welcome back, Justin. It's been a while. Josh and I have been holding out the fort for you. It's really good to see you. How have you been? I have been uh, up and down a little bit uh, sick, but also at times, unfortunately, just not available. And if it wasn't for you guys picking up the slate, we may not have even had a podcast for a week. So all I can say is big thank you to you guys for actually picking up the slack. It's been amazing. And you guys have done a fantastic job. And all credit goes to you for your rant on Adelaide, which was superb. Mwah. So you liked it then, Justin? <laughs> I, what did you think of the uh, Melbourne one on Sunday night? Uh, look, you're just echoing my thoughts here. To be honest, I've been sort of saying the same things. Don Pike and uh, Simon Goodwin, what are they doing? Yeah, I don't know either. I've got actually a, a, another one coming up. Luke Beveridge is my you know, <laughs> next target. Yeah, he's um, probably one of the most overrated coaches going around at the moment. It's it's hard because his team in 2016 made that miraculous run on the back of probably one of the most ridiculous AFL rule changes made during the season. But since then, they've just reverted to true form of just basically making up the numbers, if not always outside the top eight. Yep, totally agree. I actually don't rate Luke Beveridge at all. And it still disappoints me that 2016 went the way it did. Yeah. Sadly, that's history though. Yeah, look, they were an amazing team in 2016, especially through the finals. So you can't really, I guess, begrudge them the fact that they won because they were very, very good. We should have won that match if it wasn't for the umpires just blatantly cheating. That's another discussion for another time. But before we move on to the agenda and the actual show, I'd just like to say that the dogs really aren't performing that much better under Beveridge than they were under their previous guy, McCartney. Totally agree, Justin. I think we're actually going to see him come back out of the shadows very soon. Yeah, it would be very interesting. It would be even more interesting if he actually returned to the Bulldogs. But uh, no doubt more on that a bit later on. Uh, top of the agenda for tonight's show, uh, we have Isaac Heaney, 100 games. Woo! Woo! Well done. Well done. He's uh, a top academy prospect. He's one of the actual few academy prospects that we've had who's made a pretty good AFL career. Uh, and speaking of academy prospects, we also have another one debuting, Stephen, and his name is... James Bell. Woo, did awesome. You see, did you see the video, Justin? I did, I did. It actually brought a tear to my eye. Uh, I should do one of those YouTube reaction videos. you probably see me sobbing like a little girl in the corner watching it, but I thought it was really touching. Beautiful moment, and uh, honestly, got to wonder what his mum said afterwards when she saw the video. Yeah, I was a bit surprised. I actually really liked it, though. James Bell, obviously a bit of a soft touch. The way he cried with his mum and the fact that he couldn't get in contact with his dad. <laughs> How cute was that? Oh, it was awesome. It's great that the Swans put that out there. You don't see a lot of that sort of content. But uh, look, with the way that the season's going, things have got to change. Uh, we haven't been putting up much content on the blog for, for various reasons, mostly because we just haven't had time or energy recently to do it. So it's great that the Swans have done that for a bit of fan engagement but Isaac Heaney 100 games uh he's sort of firming to be that game breaking forward come midfielder that we really desperately need to do I guess we need more of him we need we need to clone him we need more copies I totally agree Justin I think we do need a few more of him I still think he's a bit of a flash in the pan player but he is a tremendous asset and I think we actually deserve to actually get a lot more out of him. I just wish he was a bit more consistent. 
Yeah, look, he's an, uh, an impressive athlete. He's physically, uh, he's a specimen. I mean, he may as well be called the specimen. And the rig, you know, he just looks amazing. His athleticism is unbelievable. He can do some seriously scary good things on the football field. You know, just got to go back to last year when he took that unbelievable screamer um, over the top of Jesse Hogan. And, and the fact that he played fullback and played one of the best quarters of football that people have seen for a long time. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And some of the marks that he's taken, some of the things that he's actually done... But do you know, Justin, his kicking efficiency isn't that good? Yeah, look, I'm not terribly surprised by that. Uh, he's, I guess, a symptomatic of the team at the moment. The, the team's disposal efficiency at the moment just isn't very good. And we've got some stats on that later on that we're going to go um, going to go through. But another one, and I know you raised this stat offline, and this ties into one of the other agenda items that we have is the fact that Josh Kennedy and George Hewitt had zero clearances last week. It's not zero each, zero. The whole zero, just zero between them. Yeah, I know. Isn't that terrible? First time Josh Kennedy's had zero clearances for the Swans in his career. Yeah, it's just utterly bizarre. And what are they averaging at the moment each? So Kennedy and Hewitt this year are averaging 1.3 centre clearances each. However... Wow. Kennedy is averaging 3.4 clearances per game. Still way below his career, which is 7.8. Yeah. Yeah, he's, um, his last two years have really been sort of stunning the way he's dropped off. And uh, like we've kind of hoped that George Hurt would come in and be that, you know, that ball-winning midfielder. It's, it's really hard when you look at to sort of really analyse the impact that losing Tom Mitchell has really had because Tom Mitchell was arguably our second best ball winner back in 2016. And yeah, I to- as it is, he's gone to Hawthorne and he's been the best ball winner in the league by an absolute mile. Yep, totally agree, Justin. Couldn't say any more than that. It was a silly decision to let him go the way we did. We actually thought we had more time out of Kennedy and Jack and it just hasn't oh, no. happened. No, they've, they've fallen off. And I think it was as clear as 2017 when Josh Kennedy got the captaincy, but his level already at that point, he'd already peaked. And, and um, maybe that was a knee injury, because he went into the finals last year with an injury, and he picked up another one. Yeah, that's true. And 2016, didn't he have some issues as well yeah. early on? Yeah, he did. So he's, he's a bit like that, you know, Dan Hanabry up until we moved him on, and Lance Franklin just had recurring niggling injuries. Uh, Heath Grundy... He was forced into retirement through recurring niggly injuries. So we've had a number of players who have gone through that, especially Kieran Jack and his hip injuries, uh, very well-publicized hip injuries and issues in general. Uh, But I don't want to get too bogged down on that. But I believe that both are averaging a fair bit below the uh, season average, aren't they? That is correct. So the season average for centre clearances for a predominant midfielder is 326 well, so our Kennedy and Hewitt are way below that at 1.3. Yeah. And we've even had to rope Luke Parker into that midfield role as basically an extractor. And that's not what his best position is, not by a long shot. No, that's right. See, he's only averaging two centre clearances a game. Still well below the season average and the career average of AFL footballers. Yeah. And look. For for those who may not know, Luke Parker's better position is as a link player. So historically, over his career, he's actually been a second or third possession player in a in a possession chain. He's rarely been the player giving the ball off. So him and Hanabry were were typically the second and third players in the chain. Uh, the first possession players were your Ryan O'Keefe's, your Josh Kennedy's, and your Tom Mitchell's. Um, and to some extent, early in his career, you were looking at your, your George Hewitt's when he moved into the midfield. But I think we're just sort of lacking midfield ball winners at the moment. Josh Kennedy's at the other end of his career. Uh, George Hewitt hasn't really come on. It's a bit of an interesting situation that we're in. Yeah, totally agree. And the concern for me is when Ryan Clark and Ollie Florent, who are your two major ball winners out of the centre, and they both play on the wing. Yes. Or when you had Aaliyah, who had 
four of the Swans' 10 centre clearances about a month ago. And McLean, who's getting, you know, four or five clearances a match. Okay, sure, he's a ruckman, but he's doing it comprehensively. That's right. Well, didn't he have six on the weekend? Yeah, and he had, what, like six, seven tackles as well. Yeah, that's right. He was probably arguably be our best midfielder. Yeah, and I think that says a lot in a game that we lost by two points. That's exactly right. So, look, uh, team changes. Um, we'll just quickly go through them. Um, I'll give you the ins, uh, and you can give us the outs, Stephen. But the ins, James Bell, absolutely fantastic. It's great to see him get a debut. Uh, I know that we talked about him in the preseason as a player to watch. And Sam Wicks is now the last one, I think, that could get a shot before the end of the year. And he certainly deserves it on his early season form. And we do, of course, welcome back our co-captain, Dane Rampey, from his eye injury, which did look rather nasty. Out space, Stephen? Well, this one was pretty obvious in the former captain, Kieran Jack. Didn't have yeah. a very good game last week. Has struggled all year, and I reckon he'll get a farewell game in round 23, and that will be it. The Swans fans will say goodbye. The other one is sort of expected as well, considering he only had four possessions for the day. In James Rose. The yeah. question I have for you, Justin, is that the last time we see James Rose? I think it's the last time we see both. I mean, you don't think they'll give... If we're handing out farewell games, then we might as well just bring back Grundy and Tippett. Seriously, I mean, what's, what's, what's the point? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good point. Yeah. We, we might as well put the 120 minutes into actually giving someone who deserves to go a crack. So... I'd rather see Riley Stoddard, maybe even Matthew Ling, who barely looks like he's going to be able to be fit enough. Uh, probably Jared McVeigh, who deserves it, despite the fact that he's half as fit. Uh, maybe even Joel and Marty, just to see what he's got. And Sam Wicks, I think they are four or five players more deserving than Kieran Jack. And James Rose, it's a shame, because he actually did look like he took his opportunity, and then he just got dropped. Yeah, I was surprised by that. The, the week he got yeah. dropped, he'd averaged, got 23 possessions that game. Exactly. And since he's gone back to the reserves and he's been up and down and he comes back in and gets four disposals and he was very ordinary, let, let's, you know, let, let's not mince words, he wasn't great. But he wasn't the only one who was very ordinary that game. Lewis Malikin in particular was finally dragged and then dropped, so. Yeah, that's right. And we, we've had situations where this has happened. If you actually look at it, Last week, we had five guys that had less than 10 possessions. Yeah. Yeah, so, it's it's weird. Look, some of those players are young and you know inexperienced, um, but it, at the same time, it, it hurts us. Yeah, that's exactly right. The sad thing is, our senior players aren't doing what they should be doing either. No, and I think it's fair to say that it's been a recurring issue for the last three seasons. Yep, totally agree. I know we've been crueled by injury, but our senior players that are out there are not giving as much as what we would expect at this time of year or at this time of situation. You can understand the young kids dropping off, like Blakey's really dropped off, but the senior players should be able to hold their heads up, and I don't think they are. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, like, I mean, it's just that seven-game run at the start of 2017 when we finally won against Brisbane. I mean, that was primarily the senior players dropping off. We had another six-game losing. Well, we lost six out of seven early in the year, and now we're on another five-game streak. And you can track it back to the fact that the senior players have just fallen off and the young guys are too inexperienced to carry the team. Yeah, that's exactly right. And some of those young guys are now starting to show up. The one that I've been very impressed with that's not slowing down, and he is a second-year player, but that's Tommy McCartan. Yeah. been very impressed with how he's gone. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a weird one because he's forced to play a couple of different positions. And, and you, you kind of look back at um, uh, Hunter from West Coast who could play forward and back, and I think that's kind of what they're looking for, except minus the shocking attitude and the atrocious haircut and the totally punchable face. But... If they could get Tom McCartan to play that swing role and play it really well, then uh, I think that's really good. But the problem yeah. is, he's 19 years old. You can't keep throwing up, up and back, up and back. Yeah, that's right. You are causing yourself issues. Are you going to make him a jack of all trades or are you going to make him a master of something? 
But that's what yeah. we've got to make a decision of. And I think form-wise, I know that uh, the question went out, I believe, last week or, or before the last podcast. What is Tom McCartan's you know, best position? I think, for me, it's defender. He looks more composed and he has good positioning and a really good read on the play as a defender. So that's moving to the ball rather than as a forward where he has to sort of lead into space and create space. I don't think he has that, that I, I guess, forward craft just yet to do it you know, regularly and predictably and, you know, good to a good enough level. Yeah, I totally again, agree with you. You could say the same for Sam Reid too at times. Yeah, that's right. But I totally agree with you with, around Tommy McCartan. He does look much better and in the back line, and I actually think he could become one of the league's premier centre-half backs. Yeah, he's looked really good. I still remember that, that Carlton game uh, that we all went to, uh, me you and Josh, and he looked... Absolutely superb a centre half back for his first game at centre half back. Yep, totally agree. That was a brilliant game. Yeah, it's one of the few that we've won this season. <laughs> yeah, that might have been why it was brilliant. Yep. <laughs> uh, look, uh, let's move into the uh, preview of the match. Now, typically we'll go through the uh, history of the two teams and talk a bit about the last game, but. Uh, Look, I, I uh, dug through the stats and I wanted to sort of chat about the stats because they they tell a, a rather specific tale of a team that is potentially overperforming and a team that's potentially underperforming. What do you think, Stephen? Yeah, I totally agree with you, Justin. Some of the head-to-head stats that we've actually looked at over the past hour or so are just unbelievable in the fact that the Swans are so poor, and Port are actually quite good. Yeah, yeah, they're ranked number one in like nearly half a dozen categories, but then they're ranked like bottom three in another three or four categories, like major categories uh, as as far as ratings go, whereas the Swans are just basically like middle of the road or worse for almost every single category. Yeah, what's some of the major ones that we picked out, Justin? Uh, I would say that the fact that uh, Port are the number one ranked contested team and the Swans are ranked 16th, there's absolutely no surprise there. No, none at all. And the other one is um, Port are the number one clearance team and Swans are still 16th. So uh, I think that's um, pretty pretty obvious. And that actually talks to what we were talking about earlier in the, the podcast with Kennedy and yeah. the rest of the midfield. Now, I think the uh, really telling one for me is the uh, the difference between intercepts and turnovers. And I think this goes to sort of play on, you know, Port Adelaide's uh, Jekyll and Hyde season. And, you know, I'm going to be honest, I don't watch a lot of Port Adelaide because I don't even know what I'm going to get when I watch them. Sometimes they're electric and really exciting. Other times they're just so boring and so slow. But, look, they are ranked number one for intercept possessions in the league. Yeah. And hilariously, really hilariously, they're ranked number 18 for turnovers. They've got the most turnovers in the league by about 40. That's scary, isn't it? Who's second last? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, um, I think it was like Colton or something. Uh, I, or think, maybe I think Fremantle. it was Fremantle. Fremantle, Fremantle, Fremantle yeah. yeah. But um, they average a lot more possessions per game than the Swans as yeah. well. 27 more possessions. But, I mean, some of those stats are... Uh, yeah, the one that really Bad. interested me, Justin, was the fact that they are poor, are ranked number one for inside fifties, yet they're ranked number sixteen for efficiency <laughs> inside fifty. How the <laughs> hell does that work? I know, but get this: they're ranked second and third for kicks and handballs, respectively, and fourth for hitouts. And like I said, it's Jekyll and Hyde. They get the ball, they run it, uh, and, and the amazing thing is they're ranked sixteenth for bounces. So. Yeah. They're getting it, they're running it by hand, uh, then they kick inside forward 50 to, I don't even know what forward line they have half the time. Half the time, it just looks like they cobbled together a couple of park footballers. And it just bounces yeah, straight totally back agree. out. <laughs> so, yeah, that's right. Look, uh. th- they're suffering from injuries just like every other team, except I just love that one of their players came out a good four, six weeks ago and said, I don't even know what style of game we're playing from week to week. No one knows. Yeah, it changes each week. And then the fact that they could drop Scotty Lysette. Now, this is really interesting to me. 
He was the best on ground for the Port Adelaide two weeks ago <laughs> and got dropped. Now, there must be something going on with the club. Now, seriously, oh, I don't, I don't why know. would you drop him? Because they don't know what the hell they're doing. Yeah, and then they put Paddy Ryder back in, who's already told them he wants out of the club. Yeah, yeah. I think it's clear they don't know what they're doing. And it's been an issue with Ken Hinckley for years now, for a good three years now. He's had that team playing electric football. They go on a run, they look great, and then they just fall to pieces. It's a house of cards. They get one injury, and then the whole team just falls apart. Yeah, that's right. And maybe, just maybe, I should look at Ken Hinckley as my next coach on the chopping block. <laughs> yes, yes. Look, I, I wouldn't be against it, but yeah, no. It's so, so utterly weird. I mean, the fact that they rank elite for most of the categories that you could possibly rank for, the important categories in the AFL, they're in the top four for most of them, and yet still be ninth on the ladder. Yeah, it's a bit scary. I do they overuse the ball? What do they do? Oh, definitely. They're one of them. They're one of the highest possession teams, you know, in the league. They're the second ranked possession team in the league. Yeah. So they they're obviously using a lot of handball, a lot of kick. Yep. But anyway, and I think it's enough talk about Port Adelaide. I hate them too. Yeah, I I, I hate them. I, I I don't like their style of football. They they have no identity as far as I'm concerned. So. Yeah, that's right. I agree. They had their chance a good sort of six seven years ago, and they missed out. Oh, well, yep. shit happens. That's but right. But anyway, yeah, they've got some good young players. I, I will say that uh, I, I don't mind watching Tom Jonas play. I actually quite like him. Zach Butters uh, is a good one. And, yeah, Rosie. Uh, yeah, Rosé, Rosie. Um, he's a good one. Good bottle of wine there. And mm. the thing that uh, really gets me uh, wet under the gullet for this match is uh, Ollie Wines is an emergency. Yeah, how good is that? So what's actually <laughs> happened to him? I have no idea. He was like idea. their number one player. Yeah, I know. I know. They've uh, ditched the old Chad. And, they, and Hawthorne fans don't even like him. They want to get rid of him already. And they've got Ollie Wines on, on the emergency list. Yeah. What's going I, on? Yeah, I don't know. I do like Travis Boak, though. I actually say I've got a lot of time for Travis Boak. Yep. Well, they finally figured out what to do with Tom Rockliffe. Yeah, finally. Which was stick him in the bloody midfield. Yeah. <laughs> Hang on. You pick up this gun midfielder from Brisbane the and then you're playing in the forward line. I don't understand that. I know that. Jack Watts, I mean, yeah, I mean, Jack Watts is a disaster. We already saw that coming, but far out. Uh, but yeah, look, uh, enough on Port Adelaide. Uh, they, they're a laugh a minute. They can turn up and torture, but at the same time, they can turn up and torture themselves. So... God knows what's going to happen on Saturday. <laughs> it's going to be an right. interesting match either way. But uh, look, what's the history, Stephen? So Port Adelaide have won the last two by an average of four goals. The Swans have won both at, at Adelaide Oval between the sides, which is really good. Speaking of which, do you know the Swans have won four of their five games yeah. at Adelaide Oval? Yeah, it, it sort of speaks to their record that they had at Adelaide in general before both teams switched to Adelaide Oval. It was looking pretty ominous. Yeah. You want to know an interesting stat over the past year, two years, Justin? I'd love to. Do you know we've won 70% of our games away, but less than 40% at home? Well, that's not entirely surprising. No, not at all, is it? <laughs> no. Like, like you keep saying, we've just forgotten how to play at the SCG. We don't have the game style for it anymore. Yeah, that's right. We play this completely different brand of football that doesn't suit the SCG. Anyway... The Swans lead head-to-head, 5-2 since round 13, 2014. The Swans are 15th with six wins. Port are ninth with nine wins. Yeah, the percentage as well, not a big difference. So, you know, ladder-wise, you know, there's not a lot of difference between the two teams. Uh, but uh, play-wise, I mean, we're looking at potential play. There's a fairly big gap, I'd say, that if Port Adelaide can bring their best... And they've got Charlie Dixon in the forward line. And, and, and let's be honest, if if he's on, six, eight goals easy, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah that's right. And Justin Westhoff, yep. too, could actually have a big one. Yeah, exactly. So they've got a lot of threat in the air in the forward line. And, and good crummers at ground level. Robbie Gray as well. At, at one point, he was elite. He was regarded as one of the best players in the league full stop. So uh, it's interesting. It's going to be an interesting match. 
Yeah, I totally agree, and I'm actually looking forward to it. Saturday at two twenty or two ten. Uh, God, I think it's like one forty. Every time I check, it's like something different. Yeah, I know. That's what I keep seeing too. <laughs> yeah, it's early afternoon. I was having a look. Um, look. I'm going to have a quick look at the AFL app right now because I did have a look and one site suggested it was one time at like 6 o'clock and I was like, nah, that can't be right. 2.10. 2.10. 2.10. Yeah. So, oh, that's yeah. a good time. I like the afternoon yep. games. Yeah, this is good. It's a good time to watch anyway. But uh, look, um, season head-to-head, and this is the interesting one as well. Uh, Port Adelaide leading us in most categories. They average 27 more disposals. 400 to 373, nine more clearances, 43 to 34, 10 more inside 50s, 58 to 48, uh, 20 more contested possessions, 158 to 138, 14 more hit outs, and that is going to be a lot more on the weekend, 44 to 30, and we have reached two more tackles, 66 to 64. That was something that really concerned me from the last game, Justin. Our tackling has really dropped off. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting one. You go back a couple of seasons, we're averaging over 80 tackles a game. Yeah, I know. And what's happened? We, oh. What did we get in the last game? I don't know. I Honestly, I don't know. I think, I think it was in the uh, low 50s. It could have even been in the 40s. Yeah, look, um, there was some good stuff from last game. Uh, there was some... Uh, not so good stuff from last yeah. game. Uh, we had 73 turnovers to 71. So, you know, that, that's something. And uh, tackles. We had 67 tackles. Oh, 67, was it? Oh, well, that's not too yeah. bad. It's not too bad. But oh. we still trailed by four. So yeah. we, we lost that count. Yeah. Oh, well. Not yep. to worry. Not to we'll worry. We'll be better this week. Yes, yes. And uh, look, before we continue, look, uh, where do you think the Swans are going to have to get it right this weekend, Stephen? Do you really want me to answer this, Justin? I want you to answer. Justin, it is the midfield. Josh yes. Kennedy. You have to step up. You need to be the man this week because if you do not, we are dead in the water. You are our inspirational leader on the field, but you look like a ridiculous clown at the moment <laughs> running around out there. You wow. need to pick up and actually show us what you can do. I've got money riding on you this week, Josh oh, Kennedy, wow. and yeah. I want you to get more than 10 clearances. Ooh, man. If he's getting 10-plus clearances, he's won about the clock about four years. That's what I'm hoping for, Justin. That is an epic match. Uh, look, this is uh, kind of touching on some of the stuff we'll do later in the show, but uh, look, for me, I think I think it's going to be fairly obvious because Port Adelaide are going to have more of the ball. And we don't have the uh, we don't have the spread or the leg speed, really even the tactical nows at the moment to really sort of stop that. I think where we're going to uh, get them has to be we have to pack the defence and just force them to kick long, kick long and high, and just dump it in time and time yeah. again. The problem that I have with that is we're not going to win games out of our defence. It just doesn't happen. No, but we can stop them from scoring. And it's not too dissimilar to what GWS did against Port Adelaide last time they played them. And that was uh, two weekends ago. And what was the score? Like 53 to 51? Yeah, it was very low. And I think only one point was scored in the last five minutes, despite the fact that Port Adelaide... It was 56 to 55, sorry. Port Adelaide absolutely dominated the last half of that quarter and scored like one point in about... 15 minutes of play. Yeah, and they Adelaide... shanked it. It was an absolute shank as well from Dersma. Right in front, shanked it. That's right. Port Adelaide are not very good at when they've got defensive pressure on them. They actually crumble. Yeah, exactly. And, oh no, it was Darcy Byrne-Jones, but Dersma did have a shot it's at the half halfway point of the last quarter, directly in front, and shanked it. So, it, it's interesting. That's why I think like if we can pack our defence and their forward line, they won't get easy shots at goal. And that's what they like. They they just like fish and chips business. Yeah, that's right. And like Brisbane absolutely thrashed them. True, true. That's very true. But Brisbane are a good side. Yeah, but I think they set the uh, blueprint for, for um, beating them as well. Yeah, you're probably right. Basically, my opinion is... If we win the midfield battle, 
whether we actually block up our back line or not, if we win the midfield battle, we will win the game because yeah. our midfield needs to be running both ways. If they're not helping out the back line, they're going to get pummeled. If they don't run into the forward line and actually deliver the ball well, we're going to get slaughtered because we won't score. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, Big time for Ollie Florent this week. Yeah, 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 yep. <laughs> <laughs> goes, goes, goes without saying, I think. And look, um, on that note, we are going to take a quick break. We're going to be back right after this. Welcome to Intermission. And we're back, and it is now time for our Swans Blog Player of the Year, your fan vote. So you sent them in to us after the match last weekend. Stephen, how did the players go? Well, interesting. I am quite surprised by a couple of the choices from the fans, Justin, but I'll go one to five. One vote to Zach Jones. Yeah. Wasn't too bad. Defensive pressure was good. Yeah. I mean, his foot skills are getting better. They are. Two votes to Callum Mills. Great work in the back line. Yeah. Played a key defensive position, and I thought he was terrific. Yeah, I've really liked his last fortnight, actually. Yeah, me too. Three votes to Tom Papley. Leadership man is coming out in him. The first five minutes was brilliant. Drifted away in the second and third. Came back in the fourth. Pretty yeah. good game from Tom Papley. Yep. Four votes for Isaac Heaney. The master magician. Had 15 minutes of terrific play for the game. Went missing just like Tom Papley for a little bit of the second and third, but came back with a vengeance in the last quarter and almost got us over the line. Pity he missed those two kicks. Yeah, he was very uh, Franklin-like in his overall performance, wasn't he? In and out, in and out, then bang. Yeah, that's right. And if he could do that on a more consistent basis, he would be an absolute superstar and he'll yep. win a Brownlow. Yep, agree. And the five votes, Justin. You would not believe who got the five votes. It is the GOAT himself, Mr. Jordan, I love you, Dawson. <laughs> oh, he has been absolutely fantastic this year. I, re I still remember a couple of years ago we were begging to get him into the senior team. Yep, I remember too. We were talking yep. about it two years ago. Yep, after the uh, need for grand final, after that breakout season, it's like, where is he, where is he? Then they finally bring him in. And they put him in defence. He just looks like a slow plotter who can who can barely keep up with the football. But, jeez, he looks good now. He does. Silky smooth skills. Great decision maker. Can play anywhere on the field. I will actually go as far to say is he's probably our most important player yeah. inside currently. I would go as far to say. I reckon he's jumped up right into best of Ferris contention. Yeah, I agree with you because I reckon yeah. they'd be going and looking from inside and they'd be going, right... He is the person that is probably controlling our play. It was Josh Kennedy by a fair way early on with Dane Rampey and, and Tom Papley sort of coming in. Then I reckon Papley and Aaliyah through the middle part of the season where Jordan Dawson's just slowly building up. But Dawson's been amongst the best for the last month and a half, two months. Yeah, agreed. I would actually reckon you could go back through the season and I'd say probably from around five onwards, he would be in the top five players each week. Yep. Yep. We've had him in the top five regularly, and the fans have had him top five for, God, most of the season now. Yeah, that's right. He is definitely the GOAT, Justin. Yeah. Yeah, he is. The, uh, he's doing pretty bloody good. Yeah. Speaking um, of that, before yep. we move on, the other GOAT, his brother GOAT, did very well in the cricket as well, Justin. Yeah. Yeah. Please do tell is obviously the goat himself, Mr. The Spinning Off Spinner, <laughs> Mr. Nathan Lyon. 
Brother Goat, brother from another mother. Yes. Yes, um, brother Goat. Uh, we are segueing on this show for a bit, like we uh, occasionally do for for some laughs. But uh, Australia won the first Test of the Ashes, surprisingly, with an outstanding second innings batting performance by Matthew Wade, who finally got his chance, kind of cocked it up big time in the first uh, innings, but made amends in the second. And Nathan Lyon and Pat Cummins. Uh, That's exactly right. And Justin, I'd just like you to go on record and say that... I was wrong. Uh, yeah, you were wrong because you said Matthew Wade shouldn't have been in the side and was uh, garbage. Yes. yes, I said he's garbage playing against shitty bowling attacks from the shift. But look, uh, credit credit's due. Well, I, I ate my hat on this one. Uh, he was absolutely superb in the second innings and Stephen Smith is uh, back to his best. But i I got to say, we'll move back on to the football in a second. But who's Mitchell Stark? Mitchell who? Yeah, where did he go? But yeah. I'm, I'm still a bit dubious about um, Siddle being in the side. I'm just not 100% he did well. certain. He no. did well. He he is a good English conditions uh, bowler. I, I think that's why he's in. And it was a good selection because he picked up key wickets in the first innings. But more importantly, he bowled a really tight line and they didn't get on top of him. Yeah, very much the old Glenn McGrath style, yep. wasn't it? Just nagging away on the off stump. That's all it was. And it left someone like Pattinson to go in there and be really aggressive, and he picked up a couple of wickets. But, uh, yeah, Pat Cummins, second innings, just jagged the ball in short when there was almost no bounce and variable bounce, and he just kept getting wickets from short bowling that barely went hip high. So, really good really good performance overall. Um, but... <laughs> Football. <laughs> yeah, back to the footy. Sorry, <laughs> Justin, footy. I just, just had to bring that in. <laughs> no, no, that's all right. Uh, matchups, key points, and predictions. Uh, could you please give us your matchup, Stephen? This is one that I actually hope I see this game, and I'm not 100% certain I will, but I'm really hoping. It's Travis Boak versus Ryan Clark. I actually think that Ryan can actually nullify Travis's influence on the game. Yeah, it's an interesting one because Travis spoke. he has been up and down and there's been games where he's been amazing and then there's been games where he's looked about 100 years old. Yeah, that's right. Early in the season, he was just dominating. Oh, I yeah. put him in my fantasy team. He was averaging 120-odd points a week. <laughs> that's huge. I know. Yeah. yeah. But, and then uh, he just dropped off. Well, Ryan Clark, I think, needs... um, I, I don't know. It, it was a little bit weird watching him last week because I only watched maybe two-thirds of the match being um, at a wedding. So the reason why I wasn't on last week because Saturday I was at a wedding, so I watched maybe two-thirds of the match between the ceremony and reception, and then Sunday I was making beer with my friend. So he was teaching me how to make beer. That, that was more important, that wasn't was, it? I've got to be honest, like making beers you know, and, and cider and stuff like that, that's a good hobby for a guy to have, just like a podcast. But with you and Josh backing me up, I can do those sort of things. But Ryan Clark, I mean, he was a bit weird last week. He was playing defense, and then he was playing midfield, wasn't really doing much, and then he sort of grew into the game. And then he went bang! He did. And he just dominated in the second half. He was easily our best midfielder for the day. And not only that, I actually probably go as far to say, Justin, he was probably the best half of football from one of our midfielders this year. Yeah, look, you even had him in your best. You I rated did. him five in the votes. So, uh, look, I think that goes to say how highly you rated him. And he was effective. And, and let's be honest, at, at one point, he look, he literally looked like our only midfielder. Yeah, that's right. He had that- two really good passes inside 50. One was a goal assist and one, I think, went on the full. But, yeah, it was, it's just really good play that he was doing. Yeah, and the fact that he actually just went in and won the ball and actually nullified his opposing midfielders. Yeah, exactly. That was the best of it. He just did it with a plum, and it was beautiful to watch. And we all have had our criticism against him this year, but he just stood up when it was needed. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting one because he's in and out of the side, so... You just kind of wonder if there's a future for him, but I think he's doing what he possibly can to to prove it. And he's another one like you just stick him in the midfield. That's where his best position is. That's right. Uh, but my matchup, and this is an important one, and I think it's more of a defensive role than an attacking role. It's got to be Sam Reed and Tom Jonas. 
explain. Tom Jonas has been having a pretty damn good season with Houston in defense, and they intercept the living bejesus out of everything in the air. Right? If Sam Reed can do a good job at Preventing Jonas and Houston from intercepting, that goes a long way to us getting brown, uh, getting ground ball goals, which I think are going to be key to us trying to get a win or even get close to a win out of this. It's not going to be marks inside 50. It's going to be ground ball gets and scramble goals. Yeah, that's right. And if Reed can actually take a mark and hold a couple of marks early on in the game, he'll get some confidence and we'll be right. Yeah, exactly. And it'll force Port Adelaide to potentially rotate or put more pressure. So that's my matchup. And uh, your key point, please, Stephen? This is a really interesting one, and it's something that we've already sort of touched on. But if we can actually get someone who can win a centre clearance that is not Hayden McLean, (laughs) we might actually (laughs) win the game. Hey, look, he's an extra midfielder, you said. Yeah, he is. And he is playing like a big mummy. But the problem is... Hey, he did he can't job. be the only one. No, and he did a good job. I will say, for a guy who's like barely 195, 196, he did a good job. He did. I was actually really impressed. But the thing is, he's never going to be that Ruckman who wins lots of taps. To be honest, we haven't had a Ruckman who wins taps for a long time. No, I can't remember the last one. Who do you reckon it was? Um, um, Darren Jason, Jolly? Yeah, Darren Jolly. Jason, Jason Ball. Ball. Yeah. Going back. Yeah, I know. Uh, long, Shane Mumford when he played for us and wasn't yeah. crook or off his face. Mike Pike in 2012. Yeah, Mike Pike was getting a lot of hit outs. But we haven't really had a dominant hit, uh, dominant tap ruckman for a good decade now. No, that's right. So, okay, here's one for you. And before I go on to my key point, uh, when Sam Naismith is ready, do we actually bring him in for Hayden McLean? No. I agree with you. And I agree with you because McLean is a better footballer. Totally agree. And can you believe we're saying this six months after he was picked up from obscurity? And we're like, who the F is Hayden McLean? Hayden McLean. <laughs> I know. The funny thing is for me, Sam Naismith, while we might win more taps with him, he doesn't do anything around the ground. And his percentage of actual winning tap percentage over That's his career isn't, isn't, isn't good. Yeah, he's low. He had a pretty good... I think his highlight for me was the 2016 grand final first quarter where he just looked like a monster. Yeah, sadly, he dropped out after the first quarter, though. He did, yeah. Uh, But anyway, back to uh, current day uh, issues, and which is my key point. And I've already touched on this. It's got to be flood the port forward line. Um, And and if we can stop them just getting the uh, fish and chip type goals that they love, the uh, low pressure, chip it around... You know, run into clear space and just bang it into the third tier. If we can prevent that sort of business, then it's going to go a long way towards us having a chance. We just can't let the easy goals come. Yeah, totally agree, and I agree with your point. Basically, we need to stop them from just having those easy out-the-back goals. If we do that, we've got a chance. Yeah, they uh, they remind me of 18 C goals on the field. Yep. Totally agree. <laughs> Actually, it reminds me of Adelaide of 2017. Yeah, it's just so weird. It's just it's so... They're such a bizarre team. Uh, ah. Your prediction, please. All right. This one's more of a hope than actually something that I think will happen. But Joss Kennedy will have 10-plus clearances this week, and he will go <laughs> almost and break the record. Oh, mate, if he can do that, then that's going to be us winning the game. And uh, all bow to the king again, because that is a massive performance. That's right, but it's not the king just for one game. He has to do it consistently yep. again. Yep, yep. Uh, I'd love it if that happens, um, but I think that's a bit of an out-there prediction, like your uh, Carlton win a few years ago. Yeah. The thing <laughs> is, though, I reckon Josh Kennedy will actually be hurt. I really do, after oh, no. what happened last week. No, well, you mean uh, in the loins or not physically hurt, but no, it'd be hurting not... to prove himself. Self. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'd hope George Hewitt as well because George Hewitt did not have a good game. No, but George has been up and down all year. Yeah. And Kennedy is just, he prides himself on being that grunt man. And yeah. I just think he will actually come out and actually really, really put emphasis in this week. 
I think he's just lost two yards of pace. He's basically gone the Ryan O'Keefe. Yeah, you're probably right, and it's been very, very quick, hasn't it? Yeah, it has, and it's the game hasn't quickened up, so to say. Um, it's just that he's not, he's just slow now. So yeah. I'm not sure how long he has left in his contract, but I I wouldn't be surprised if he actually retired at the end of next year. Yeah, I agree. He needs to become a defensive forward next year, I think. I think he yeah. needs to replace what Kieran Jack was trying to do. Basically a centre-half forward or something. Um, yeah. But uh, look, my prediction is Port Adelaide will have 400-plus possessions, yet will go less than 50% kicking efficiency. Um, and I am saying I, it's not going to rain. I have no idea what the forecast is. But boy, oh boy, can they slaughter it by foot. That's right. Uh Justin, you realise that the prediction for Adelaide on Saturday is something like 70 mils of rain or something. Well, like then that. in that case, my prediction might <laughs> as well be a sure thing. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. I didn't even know that. That is legendary. I'm going with that. I'm going with that all the way to the bank. I might as well put a multi on that. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe it. Yeah, I think it's something, something between 50 and 70 mils or something is predicted wow. for Saturday. Wow, that is absolutely crazy. I am just having a very, very quick look on Google Weather. 10 days, we got on Saturday 60% rain. Yep, and it's going to be raining throughout the entire day. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, the reason I know that, when I was listening to um, AFL Sports Chat today, they were saying about they actually think the Swans will have a massive advantage because Port Adelaide haven't won a wet weather game in three years. Yeah, if it is wet, I reckon the Swans have got this. Yeah, I think so too. Hence my prediction of Swans by 16 points, Justin. Now, uh, this is going to touch into our weekend forecast, so let's get straight on to it. Sure thing, please, Stephen. My sure thing is there will be another controversial decision with the umpiring, and the media will again play it up all week. I'm so sick of the media doing this. But there's been a contra... uh, a controversial decision every single week, and it's it's a goal umpiring review issue. Yep. I agree. Or, you know, it's a mark that hasn't been taken or a free kick that's cost a game. Yeah. But the thing is, these umpiring decisions have always been there. Now the media just hypes the absolute bejesus out of it, yep. and it's just replayed consistently. Just let it die. I feel so sorry for the umpires these days. Yeah, it's a hard gig. It's always been a hard gig, but it certainly doesn't make it easier when you've got the media who's hounding it constantly. Yeah, the men's will think, ah, who gives a shit? Oh, honestly... Uh, I didn't bother me. We had 120 minutes to make an impact. I'd say the two Heaney misses basically directly in front with no wind and no rain bothered me more than men's or not really getting a free kick or that silly free kick against for that tiny little hand in the back. Yeah, or the um, even James Rose dropping the, the mark that men's will kicked into him. It yeah. was a beautiful pass, and he's dropped a chest mark. You know? Yeah, exactly. Or so, he had a set shot only a couple of minutes later and shanked it. Almost yeah. put on the full. So... The, yeah, things like that doesn't really bother me too much. I agree. I, I, I like that one. That's probably going to happen. Uh, but for me, uh, Brisbane Lions will be top of the ladder at the end of the round. Really? That's a big call. Geelong are in terrible form, and they play at home against North Melbourne, and North Melbourne have their tails up. And for me, that match can only go one way, and that is going the stripes, not the hoops. Ooh. In West Coast, host Adelaide. Yeah, and Adelaide need to win. And they have a good record in Perth. Yeah. So, it's interesting. Mm. I'm thinking Brisbane, if they win, and uh, they should be winning this one, they're going to be mm. top. Well, they could be a game on top. That'd be interesting, wouldn't it? Oh, I'd love it if they were. Uh, your most at stake, please? Uh, is John Worsfold. He, like Collingwood, Essendon have had a massive injury list. The problem is... There have been three coaches sacked so far this year. Yeah. Early on in the season, all the talk was that Worsfold was gone. It's just completely dropped off. But I don't think if he doesn't win this week or next week, I reckon he'll be gone at the end of the season, and I don't want to see it. I like him. Uh, Yeah, well, there's been criticism on on him for a long time, the fact that he's basically just a very poor match day coach and just a pretty ordinary coach in general. Uh, for me, I mean, I was kind of thinking maybe he should have gone pre-season, but yeah, such as a hype machine, you know, the external expectations of Essendon were top four, basically. Mm. But 
they have had like the second worst injury list this year. So yeah. So it's been it's been really difficult. Like you can't ha- lose ten of your top 15 players throughout the year and still be really competitive. And yet, look when they, over the last five to six weeks, Essendon have probably been one of the form sides. If they hadn't have had the injuries over the last two weeks, I reckon they would have been pushing close to top four. Yeah, I mean, they've they've scrapped together. Um, You know, they've basically scraped across the line. They got, you know, absolutely... Let's be honest, they got belted against Port Adelaide. They got absolutely thrashed. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely smoked, but they've they've done well. Uh, yeah. you know, they barely beat the Suns. Uh they mm. they weren't that impressive against Adelaide. Uh, they beat us. They just beat North Melbourne. It's, it's from and they only just beat the Giants. So I mean they've been consistent. If anything, they've been consistent. Yeah, that's right. But, but they're literally a goal either side of being 5-1 and 1-5. Yeah, that's true. But that um, game last week against Port Adelaide where they got flogged, you realise that they only had 14 fit men by the end of the game. Yeah, yeah, I know. So you, you just, um, you're really risking it. Like, they actually had guys out there who shouldn't have been on the field in the end of the game. Yeah, and whether or not they've got the depth there or not to select players or replacements, you know, who knows. That's right. But um, look, my most at stake, most stake? is uh, Ken Hinckley. And look, I don't think it's even worth talking about Simon Goodwin. Melbourne aren't going to fire him. They signed him up. He's still got basically two years to run on his contract, despite the fact that he's one of coaching one of the very rare instances of a team that goes top four to bottom two in one season. I think, mm. what, Fitzroy are the only team to go bottom to top in one season. And that was back in 1918 when they were doing the round robin competition. Yeah, that's right. It's just, I don't understand it. Simon Goodwin is, I don't actually rate him as a coach at all. No. And you, most people would have heard my rant that I had the other day. But yeah. Ken Hinckley is another one. I just, what has he ever actually done? I don't know. I, I, and honestly, since he's been coach, I have absolutely no idea what their style of play is. It, it just seems to be Jekyll and Hyde. And... For me, I think it reflects a team that works more on individual ability than cohesive team play. Yeah, agreed. I so, don't understand. Yeah, if they actually had a uh, a competent coaching, and I'm not saying he's not incompetent, but if they had a uh, a Paul Ruse, I could even say Brad Scott. I mean, Brad Scott had a style of play that was quite effective for a few years. Reece Shaw, imagine what Reece Shaw would do with that team. They'd be yeah. winning every game by 60 points. Yeah. They have got a good list. Port Adelaide that, have got a very got a good list. list. They've got a list that should be challenging. And to be honest, they've been absolutely crap. But uh, look, doomsday scenario. Well, mine will be interesting. And I think some of the fans will go, what is he talking about? <laughs> this is my doomsday scenario. Kieran Jack is a late in Ooh. for Tom Papley. Ouch. Ouch. Yeah, I can understand that one. Yeah. He is an emergency. Pray I know. that he stays in Sydney. I'm sorry, I love him, but he's gone on a season or two too long. Yes, that's right. We, I actually don't think he has. I reckon he'll play on next year, but it won't be at the Swans. Guess where I think he's going to end up? Oh, you reckon the Suns? I reckon the Suns. I reckon he'll end up there as a leadership role. I reckon they'll pick him up, and I reckon they'll get someone... I don't think it'll be Burgoyne, but they'll get someone to run off the halfback flank like Hodge does for Brisbane, I reckon yeah. I'll have someone like him. I don't know why they go for him because what he can contribute and bring to a game is it's very little. Yeah, but his leadership on the field is what they'd be after. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a weird one. Look, um, mm. my doomsday is also um, this one's related. <laughs> 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 uh uh, given the fact that uh, stats-wise we're quite we're pretty close to the bottom of the ladder, uh, if we win, we basically lose pick number two. That's exactly right, Justin. Have you heard? Um, it was I can't remember who actually said it. It was on radio today on SEN. Someone has actually come out and said that they actually believe that this is the worst draft in fifteen years yep. outside of the top two picks. 
Yeah, everyone's been saying it. Uh, even St- uh, Stephen Trelaw, who's a uh, avid draft follower uh, in our group, has said that basically the top two are miles ahead. They're better than Walsh of this year, but after that, you're basically looking at second, third round picks in your top five. Yeah. Well, they actually reckon that the top 25 this year will be better than the top five next year, outside of the top two. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's weird. Mm. It really is. But so. that's the same every year, though, isn't it? You just don't know what you're going to get. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So, look, I'd love us to win, but at the same time in saying that, I'd love Melbourne to win and Sydney to, Sydney to lose. For very, yeah, very right. obvious reasons. Uh, and that's not to say I don't love the Swans, I do. Um, it's just I'm thinking next year, and uh, if we're going to be serious about trying to rebuild on the run, then we need to look at trying to get the best quality players in with the lowest possible price. And some of these players in the draft are looking good. So yeah. that's it. And the other, the other thing is, Justin, if Swans lose and Carlton actually happen to win another game, which is what I'd really like to yep. see... They go up above us, and that means Adelaide gets even further down the draft table. <laughs> yeah. that, and I love that. I absolutely love that. They traded big, and they get literally nothing. Yep, that's right. I hope Adelaide dropped down to about yep. 12th or 13th, and Carlton <laughs> finished about 15th. How good would that be? Oh, laughing all the way to the bank on that one. Uh, on that note, Stephen, I've got to say a big thank you very much for coming on tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Not a problem at all, Justin. Thank you very much. As always, you can follow us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find us on Facebook on the pages Swans Cast Podcast and The Swans Blog. Also, Twitter, Instagram, The Swans Blog. We'll be back on Sunday to review the Port Adelaide game. Hopefully, it's a win. We'll see. Until next time, go Swans. Go the Swannies. <laughs>